And joining us for a further look on what's playing itself out on that market scene is Anaki van Royen from My Wealth Investments. Uh, Anaki, always a pleasure and a good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. All right, Anaki, I think inflation prints are uh, the theme of the day. I'm keen to get your thoughts on the expectations here with the U.S. Um, and also uh, the Eurozone expecting data. Yes, you're 100% correct. Um, if, if, we are, uh, if we have a look at the month of November, we've seen a cross-asset revival in the markets, and this has been driven by the bond markets and lower yields. Um, and this performance in the bond markets spilled over to equity markets. So we've seen exceptional performances in equity markets, except for China, unfortunately. But this risk on appetite has been driven by the expectation that we we are probably reaching the pivot point now for interest rates and um, investors have all the markets have already factored in an 80 percent chance of U.S. rates coming down by May next year. ECB, we're expecting rates to start coming down in April of next year. So even crypto market has had an exceptional good month. It's all been underpinned by these lower yields. The yield curve inversion in the U.S. also improved to only 39 basis points. That's a massive improvement. So all in all, I think the expectation for the PCE number coming out later today, it's also for that, that uh, favorite gorge of the Fed to come in at 3% from 3.5 percent previously so this will be very positive for the markets if that does play out what we have seen also very interestingly uh anarchy with these lower inflation expectations is a u.s economy that is enjoying much strength with that third quarter gdp coming in at 5.2 percent is this an anomaly that we're seeing here with inflation going down and the economy uh, actually holding up pretty well in terms of uh, productivity Yes, for the U.S., that's definitely still the case. The U.S. consumer is still resilient and that economy is holding up well. So that um, that just uh, basically highlights the view um, of many investors um, who feel that the U.S. economy will experience a soft landing uh, going into next year. Um, so even though we, we expect the job market to cool slightly, we still expect a soft landing in that economy. Unfortunately, China, of course, is still struggling. Uh, we saw those PMI numbers this morning. Um, China is still contracting. Only bright spot there was the services sector, which came in above the 50 mark. So hopefully China can also start recovering next year and live up to the expectations of investors. Uh, speaking about uh, China, of course, we have OPEC Plus meeting today. That meeting was pushed back uh, from uh, last week. And China is a big uh, consumer of oil. I'm wondering if we're expecting what's happening with China to also uh, be quite a dominant feature of uh, today's meeting. Oh, yes, 100 percent. I think so. Um, and the focus, I think, definitely will be on added supply cuts going into next year. Um, and China is the kingpin because it is the largest importer of oil. So you can already see the oil price moving up <laughs> after those PMI numbers came out this morning. So I do think that we, we're going to have to deal with higher oil prices based on the production cuts from OPEC later today. And the RAND, uh, that part of it then is also important, I think, for South Africans, considering what we're expecting to happen with oil. Um, we are seeing uh, U.S. inflation possibly ticking down, a stronger U.S. economy. What does that mean for uh, the RAND or maybe even a dollar strength or weakness versus what could be happening with the RAND? Well, if, if we take a bit of a longer term view, it actually bodes well for the RAND because if we reach the pivot point in the U.S. in the short term, that means you're looking at a at a weaker dollar going forward. That's good also for demand for commodities. It makes commodities cheaper. And that is good for commodity currencies, which South Africa is. So it will boost the demand for our commodities. And then we will look at a stronger rand going forward. So it 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 actually looks quite positive for the rand going forward then if if all things remain equal and we don't experience any any um extreme circumstances or shocks going forward. And I can keep to get into some company news with you, uh, possibly starting off with Spa, uh, reporting a 47% plunge there uh, in their operating profits. I think this is evidence of what uh, one uh, IT hiccup can really do uh, to a company of that size. And I guess the fact that they're a wholesaler uh, also is what uh, had that IT issue really eat into their profits. 
Yes, definitely. Yes, um, that they have guided for a drop of between forty-three percent to fifty percent. Um, so they have come in well within what they have guided the market towards. And uh, the share price was actually green the last time I looked, so it's been fully discounted. They um, they did manage to increase their turnover by ten percent. They've They've still managed to generate cash of 6.2 billion. Their profit dropped 47% to 1.8 billion. And against this economic backdrop that we've had in South Africa, um, you know, I, I suppose it was to be expected. But unfortunately, the non-recurring expenses did um, make the results uh, a little bit worse. So the 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 implementation of the SAP software system, it did cost them in the short term, but long term they will reap the benefits from that. So I actually think uh, that the group is attractively uh, priced at the current levels and um, not a bad one to look at going forward. I think that valuation looks quite positive. It's a well diversified company. Um, Poland, they're still struggling, but the European business didn't do bad at all. So I like them at these levels. Yeah, that share price up 4%. It really is a very, very fascinating. Oh. Let's touch on Lewis now. They have also gone on, uh, you know, to report a set of numbers. I'm not surprised that credit sales are dominating, uh, you know, what's happening at Lewis. It just is uh, that kind of uh, economic, uh, part of the economic cycle that makes sense. Yes, yes, 100%. So that is also quite a solid result. Um, like you rightly say, it actually makes sense that demand for for credit sales actually pick up um, in this environment. One just has to be cautious that it doesn't spiral out of control, but I don't think we are there just yet. So 8% up in sales, 8% up in profits, um, and they have declared a dividend. So very positive result from them. Also attractively priced, so longer term, Lewis not looking bad at all. Markets also driving that share price more than 7%. And again, I'm keen to get uh, your stock pick uh, in a bit. But first, let's reflect on counters that have found favour with your industry peers. My stock pick is uh, S&P Global. Uh, it's a company that, um, that we often hear about in the ratings uh, space as a ratings agency. Uh, they run the market indices, uh, the S&P indices. That's a big part of their business. Um, they provide market data as well. They've got a commodity insights business and other industry insights um, operations. And I think it's one of those businesses that we like because it fits the, the quality. Um, it's got quality attributes and growth attributes. Um, and uh, I think you know you, it's one stock that you can buy and hold and uh, just watch it grow its earnings. Uh, show you great returns on capital and, and continue compounding into the future. Uh, and those are the kinds of stocks that we really like. The biggest mistakes I've made in investments, uh, luckily enough, most of them eventually did pay off, was to try and catch a falling sword. You know, where a company hits a bad patch and the share price collapses and I buy too soon. So I'm fully aware that Bitvest might be one of these uh, normally, I've made these mistakes with them um, with truly cyclical companies, and that's one thing Bitvest is not is a truly cyclical company. It's actually, you know, as I said earlier on, maybe one of these compounding companies. Mm. And because it's taken such a pounding in the last couple of days since that uh, trading update that that they gave through us, I think it shows really nice value at these levels. We all know what it's in. You know, we, we we might not realize it, but we touch a Bidvest product or a Bidvest service virtually every day of our lives. I'm going for Eli Lilly. Um, I just think this is a big industry. These weight loss drugs, the obesity drugs, the diabetic, you know, diabetic drugs are big. Look, they've also got Alzheimer's, which is very close to me as well, which I watch with great interest <laughs> to see if they're making any progress there. <laughs> I wouldn't have said you've so, displayed uh, any signs yet of Alzheimer's, so uh, we'll tell so, you. Um, I, I think this is going to be a bigger industry than, than we imagine in the pharmaceutical side. And the numbers being brandished about, which I don't want to quote because I'm probably going to get wrong, hmm. um, don't dismiss it. And I think the consequences of this are, are significant as well. In other words, it can have issues in other industries. 
Right, again, keen to get your thoughts on some of those, Eli Lilly, uh, Bitvest, as well as S&P Global. I actually agree um, with all of them. I think the most exciting of them all is Eli Lilly, probably by far the most expensive as well. But I think that that PE can, un it can unwind pretty quickly if the growth is there. And what makes it so exciting um, is the, the drugs that they use for the treatment of diabetes. And there's one specific drug in, in, in their product range that might be used as a chronic weight management drug. And that one will probably compete with Ozempic. I don't know if you are yeah. aware of what's been happening in that yeah. market. So <laughs> based on that, I definitely think Eli Lilly will, will be my top pick out of those two. Although I do like the other two. I think Bedvest is positioned well uh, for where we are currently in the interest rate cycle. And then S&P Global, I think that one will just continue to be a valuable day for portfolios. So I do like all three of those. And again, which counter are you going with today? I'm going to go with M10 because uh, the market has performed so well over the course of November. So a lot of stocks are a lot of stocks, sorry, um, are a little bit overbought in the short term. But M10 is still at a very, very attractive entry level. You know, and the fact that they have that strong balance sheet, they continue to generate strong cash. They have a, a very competent management team with a proven track record, which have st the management team has steered them through so many difficult um, scenarios in Nigeria. So I'm confident that they will steer them through the current one and then that possible value unlock from a from a possible spin-off of the fintech business. It's just I, I just think you can't go wrong, but you have to be able to stomach the regulatory risks that come with it as they are invested across different uh, geographies, but yeah, in ten, I think it's good value at these levels. Fantastic, Anaki. Always a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for speaking to us this afternoon. That was your midday markets update with Anaki van Royen from My Wealth and Investments.